Hi everyone, so in this tutorial I'm going to show you how I did this drawing of this golden retriever. Now typically you'll notice that on my other tutorials where I've got my pet portrait shown there, I've got a glow effect background. Now normally when I have that I will always do that background first and get that glow around the edge of my subject. The reason being I can then overlap my details onto that and I don't have to then worry about going over my details and then redoing them if I was to have done my background last. Now for this, this was done on white pastel matte paper so I didn't have to worry about any background. I went straight in with the subject and as always I do like mapping in the eyes first getting the general shape right and then I start working on the iris color and of course here the reflection now the reflection in the eyes is really crucial and here is a prime example you'll notice that it isn't completely straight it is following the curve of the top shape of the eye now if we make the reflection here too horizontal too vertical too many straight lines we are going to completely change the shape of the eye itself so the reflection although we want to make sure we get it as bright as what's needed it's also really important to get the shape of it accurate too so for my base layers here, I'm using my eye makeup applicators and I am working from light to dark. Now normally when we're working with pastels, we do usually have the layering process from dark to light. But for this fur colour, I always do it in reverse. The reason being, I always find if I go down with my darker colours first, I'll then have a tendency to risk muddying up my layers. I can then end up making the fur look too dark and more of that muddy colour, which is really not what I'm going for. Of course, I want this to look like this light coloured golden retriever. So my preference is to always err on the side of caution and layer my light colours first. What I will then do is sort of reinforce my subtle shadows, getting a little bit more of the colour accurate and then going in with my shadows to break up some of those lighter sections. I do find this is my preference. I can then layer my lighter colours back on top. So I'm mixing between the two methods, but predominantly I will work from light to dark. And I also show this technique when working on this Labrador portrait, which is available on YouTube. So if you would like to see the video here on how I created that dog, I will link that in the description below. Now, I also have a real time tutorial of this Labrador to the right hand side available on Patreon, where I'm showing you one section. It's about an hour long, as I say, all in real time. And I'm showing you the exact colours that I'm using and the order of which I'm layering. Because with this fur type, I did find that you can use the same combination of colours but if you layer them slightly differently you will get a different colour or a different tonal value. So if that real time tutorial is also of interest I'll link my Patreon in the description below. Now the first few layers they don't look great and that's why I like to work in small areas and I talk about this a lot on all of the tutorials. If you're finding that you've got too many pieces that you haven't finished or you're getting a little bit overwhelmed it's usually because we're working on too much of a larger area. It gets too overwhelming, we start to hesitate and then sometimes we just won't finish that portrait. Now of course if it's a pet portrait we don't have that ability to do that we need to get these finished so rather than stress ourselves out and make ourselves anxious on I don't know what bit I should be doing I'm a little bit stuck just break it down into a smaller more manageable section and you'll find then that it's a lot easier to tackle and this is how I work regardless of the medium that I'm using so here I am just purely focusing on the fur around the eye, just on the lower cheek as well. That's it. Once I've got this about 80% complete, I'm going to move on to the next. Now the reason why I like working like this is I am a lot more motivated to carry on if I get an area fairly completed because it's already starting to look like that dog. Now, of course, if your preference is to map in each individual layer for the whole face and then do the second layer and so on, that's absolutely fine. If it works for you, then that's no problem. But if you do find you're getting a bit overwhelmed with the entire process, just focus on one or two square inch at a time. Now the other thing for this kind of fur type being that it is significantly lighter is I always want to make sure that I've got my base layers nice and soft and really well blended. You can see that I don't have any harsh start and stop points. Of course, this is going to fall down predominantly to the Golden Retriever having a softer textured fur. So it's going to be more apparent there that I want to make my base layers nice and soft as well to replicate that. 
but here you can see that the most important thing is there's no harsh lines as it gets up towards the top of the head I have made my base layer lighter so that I can follow that light source now the angle of the photograph here normally you don't see it for pet portraits but it worked really well so we decided to go for a square layout option rather than rectangle so this was 12 by 12 inches a nice size for a single subject but she's looking right up at the camera the expression the reflection in her eyes was lovely and it was a really nice portrait to work on but the lighting because of how her head was and the angle of the photo i had to make sure that i got the lighting accurate now this is the one thing that I will focus on with any portrait because the light source is crucial. I want to make sure that I've got my highlights in the right place and my shadows in the right place. If I start putting highlights and shadows where they're not needed in that reference photo, I will be adjusting the underlying bone and muscular structure of that animal. What will happen is the more that the portrait progresses and the final portrait, it won't resemble as much like that animal as it should. Now the reason being, as I've said, the shadows and the highlights, they're not random. So take the highlight above her eye there. It's significantly lighter than the fur on the bridge of the nose that I'm working on now. I've got to indicate it that because that's where the eye socket is. The shadow to the left of that highlight is indicating where the eye socket rolls over to the skull. All of these shadows and highlights are there for a reason. So it's really important that we get them as close to that reference photo as we possibly can. Now this is something that I focus an awful lot on on my slower Patreon tutorials because it is really important. Where we put these lights and darks are just as important as the fur direction, the fur length and the fur thickness. How we use that pencil is going to really underline the type of fur texture that we can see in that reference photo. Now I've just recently uploaded a ragdoll cat tutorial to Patreon which the YouTube version is also available now and that really does go in depth with how you hold that pencil to create the various pencil strokes that you're after and because that patreon version is all significantly slower you can see how important it is where where you hold the pencil the way that you've got your fingers the sort of the angle where your hand is in relation to the paper the length of the lead how much pressure you're putting on that pencil all of these things i do go in depth with with that tutorial because it makes such a difference when you're trying to create that softer fur type, the pressure you put on that pencil is crucial. Now you can see here that most of the time when I am using these pencils, I'm holding them more towards the middle or the end of the lead when I'm working on the softer layers. When I'm working on the details, I will hold my pencil closer to the lead itself. But when you're wanting to create a softer base layer, you want very minimal pressure on that pencil. You also at times want to be using the side of the lead so get a bit more of a longer point to that use more of the side and then use the pencils like you would a glaze if you're used to working with acrylics or oils. By doing that you're not actually forcing in harsh lines or too many details early on and that's something that can happen very easily. So if you think that the fur you've created doesn't have the same depth or it's not as realistic as you'd like, it's usually because you don't have enough layers. Once we've got that very first base foundation in, we then think it's okay to jump in to add in the details because there is pigment down. The problem with doing that, you don't have the depth that's built up before your detailed layers. I will do two or three, possibly four layers before I even look at any mid detail I will start like now I will start hinting at the third direction about my third layer but I'm not focusing on any of the detail that I see on top of the fur so the fur that you see that's lightest that's sitting on the top of that coat should be left for your last layers we need to be building up with the fur that's closest to the skin and building up from there because if you look at that dog and then you draw in the detail you can see at the very top of the, the top of the surface if you were to stroke that dog and touch that fur first if we were to draw that we're not going to have all of those thousands of fur details that you can see in that dog if it was sat in front of you that are closest to the skin therefore you don't want to miss any of that out it's all about working with those subtle layers now when I say thousands of hairs, that doesn't mean that we have to draw in every single one. If you're going for hyper-realistic, then yes, what that is, is you shouldn't be able to tell the difference between the drawing and the photograph. I personally like to go for photo-realistic, which you can see this is coming from the reference photo, it looks like that dog. However, you can still tell that mine is a drawing, and that is always my aim with every portrait I create. 
So for that, I don't have to draw in every single fur detail. I have to give the illusion that that is how many fur strokes you can see in that area. And that is all down to the layering process. Now, one of the biggest tips, I talk about this in a lot of the tutorials, I've got like top tip videos here on YouTube, and it is about starting with an accurate outline. Now, a dog like this, where they're looking up at the camera, it would be very easy to distort some of the proportions because it's an angle that we don't draw as regularly. So for this, you want to make sure, as always, you've got a really accurate sketch. And if you have done your sketch freehand and you notice anywhere along the way that something is slightly off, always make those adjustments at the time. Don't think, oh, I'll do that later and I'll carry on with this one part of the portrait. The reason being, if one part of the perspective and the proportions are off, it will throw off everything else. It really has a potential to then affect like a knock on effect. So always make sure that you are adjusting that when you notice it. Now, something that is a bit of a, um, a talking point with art is tracing. Now, some they say it's, it's cheating and you shouldn't do it, but there are many ways that you can get your initial sketch on your paper. My preference is to use transfer paper. One of the main reasons why is it ensures that it keeps your paper or your canvas as tidy, neat and clean as you possibly can. The reason being, I use pastel mat for my pastel portraits. It's an expensive paper. I don't want to be putting my initial freehand sketch on that paper and then having to erase it and redraw it, which will happen with regardless of how many times you freehand. However confident you are at doing it, you will always have to erase something. We never get it right first time. So I want to make sure what I do is I sketch that out on a normal sheet of cheap printer paper first. I'll get my outline accurate. I will then tape that across the top of my pastel matte paper and then I will use transfer paper between my sketch on the separate white bit of paper and then in between my pastel matte paper. I will then be able to use a pencil or an embossing tool to go over my freehand sketch. What that transfer paper does is it then puts that outline on your pastel matte paper. That means then that the paper we're using to draw or paint on is completely clean. We know that the outlines we're using are accurate because we've drawn it on a separate bit of paper first. Now, if you would like to see all of that process and how it's done in real time, I do have a tutorial available on Patreon, both with the acrylic tier and the pastels, so you can see exactly how I do that process. But the transfer paper is always going to be my recommendation because of the fact that you can keep your surface really nice and tidy. Now, that brings me on to is tracing cheating? Now, if you do trace, I think it's a valuable tool to really improve your freehand in skills. The reason being, if you were to freehand something for the first time, it's never going to be accurate. You've got to practice that. You know, it's something that the more that you do it, the better you get. If you trace something five times and then freehand it, because you've traced it five times, your brain knows it's accurate. You've seen the proportions and the perspective as it should be. When you then freehand it the second time, that second attempt will be far more accurate than the first. So tracing really does have its place in improving our freehanding skills. And what you'll find is the more that you do that, the more confident you get for freehand in future subjects. Now, of course, we do want to be able to freehand. It's important because as you can see here with any portrait, once you draw over that initial sketch with your base layer, you are having to freehand everything in anyway. But putting your initial sketch down accurately is crucial for any portrait, regardless of the subject. Now, of course, we don't want to be tracing everything but it is something that can not only speed up the process, but it will improve those skills, as I've said. So if you ever get told, oh, it's cheating, you shouldn't do that, it will be improving your skills as an artist, and that can only be a good thing. Okay, so now that I'm starting this second ear here, you'll really see how important the fur direction is. So the fur direction needs to be accurate with any element, but especially with the ears. If the fur direction here isn't as it is in that reference photo, it won't then look like the ear is attached to the head in our drawing, which is obviously not what we want. So you want to make sure that you've got your fur strokes, the right that they're traveling the right way, that they're curved, they're not straight, that they are tapered off at the beginning and the end. That's how you're going to create realistic fur strokes. But you'll notice here that when I get onto the ear itself, it's not all traveling in the same direction. 
I'm really hinting at the shape of the ear, even on the larger surface area. It starts off curving over towards the left, it then starts to arch down towards the middle and then back out at the bottom. This is indicating here at the shape of the ear, not just where it joins onto the side of her face. Now also look at the difference in the fur length. The fur on the ear, the pencil strokes there are significantly longer than the ones on her face. That is showing here that the fur texture is different. It's longer, it's softer. I have to make sure that not only am I following the fur direction, that the length of those pencil strokes are also accurate. Now I don't think the length of the pencil strokes is something that's talked about enough, which is why I go in depth with this, because it can really affect the underlying texture that we're trying to create. Take this here for example, so the fur on the body is going to be longer, here if I made my pencil stroke short I'm going to make it look like more of like a Jack Russell type coat or even a Labrador. A golden retriever has that much longer coat compared to a Labrador so I have to make sure that I'm showing that. Here you'll notice that also some of my details and my shadows are clumped together. This again is helping to replicate that fur texture. When you've got a longer coated dog, any animal, it is then going to naturally clump together more in certain places. If I weren't to clump the fur together here and draw individual strands, I am going to make it look sort of more of like a wiry course of fur. That's not what I want. Sometimes in these instances, less detail will actually give you a softer look. If you force too much detail, you are going to then make it look like that coarser, wiry type of fur texture. Now, fur texture is something that, again, I talk about a lot because we want to make sure we get that accurate. There would be no good in getting the colour of the portrait 100% spot onto the reference photo of this golden retriever and then I make it look like the coat of a border terrier. It just wouldn't look right. So although I am focusing on the colour, I'm getting that as accurate as I can, my main focus is my contrast, my light and my darks, and then that fur texture. That's going to be a combination of the direction, the length and the thickness. Now the thickness of the pencil strokes is going to be fundamentally decided by the length of your lead and the pressure of the pencil so both of these things I will make a decision at the time if I need a thicker pencil stroke I will then either work with a more blunter point less pressure more pressure and so on there are so many ways that you can get your pastels and the pencils to create different textures all purely based on the length of the lead so sometimes if you see any of the videos and I'm working with a blunt pencil, there might be a reason for that. It might not be that I'm being lazy and I don't want to sharpen it. I mean, it could be more likely, but it might be there that I'm trying to create a different pencil stroke for the fur texture that I'm trying to go for. So again, this is why I cover this in depth in my Patreon tutorials because it makes such a difference. And again, that's also why on the video I uploaded recently here to YouTube of the Springer Spaniel with the blurred tree line, the distant out of focus tree line in the background, that's why I didn't use any pastel pencils whatsoever for that. I did just stick with my soft pastel sticks or my pan pastels, depending on what you have. The reason being, if I was to have used the pencils directly, I know that I would have been tempted to add too much detail. So some cases, the pastel pencils we won't have the same effect and what I'll do is I will link that video in the description below if you would like to see how I created that. So I'll quickly briefly mention you saw me for a moment there use my soft pastel sticks directly to my paper. Now this is something that I don't do very often it's usually only the tongues because the pinks can be limited in the pastel pencils that I have because they don't rate well with the light fast chart. So when I am applying the, the soft pastel sticks to the paper I'm always making sure I'm using light pressure so that I don't feel the tooth of the paper. Because usually we do have a tendency to be a bit heavy handed with that and pick up too much of that pigment, exactly the same with pan pastels, we then do run the risk of filling the tooth of that paper. What that will mean is we can't then add details on top. If you do feel the tooth of the paper, you'll know because it feels like the pastel pencils just glide over the top, like no pigment comes out. Now, if that does happen, you can use a workable fixative to put some of that tooth back to that paper, but please be careful with that. It can, in some cases, ruin that artwork. I personally don't use fixatives for that reason, but let's say you've come all this way through this portrait and it was just the tongue area that you accidentally filled the tooth of the paper with, I wouldn't be throwing this portrait away. 
there are things that you can do to make that work either use your softer leads like your caran d'ache pencils because they will usually have more of that opaque pigment it should then be able to grip the pastel tooth of that paper a little bit more but it is something to, to be aware of but please if you do use a fixative just be cautious use it hold it about two feet away from the surface use a fine mist sprayer bottle if you can so that you don't end up with heavy droplets and you're better off working in lighter layers with a fixative so do one layer wait for it to dry do another light layer and and then wait for it to dry rather than doing one heavy layer that's what happened to me when I first used pastels and I thought I was being overly cautious but what it did is because the layer of fixative was too heavy too thick it made my details just almost vanish like it's almost like it just dissolved it's one of the reasons now why I do not use fixatives but if you do it's just something to be aware of so if you've got any questions about that, any concerns, then pop them in the comments below. I'm more than happy to help if I can. So here is a photo of the finished portrait. I really hope the tips and techniques that I've shared here are useful. If they were, I'd really appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. And if my slower in-depth tutorials in pastels or acrylics are of use, I will link my Patreon in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching and I am going to upload another video to YouTube next week.